Now I'd like to welcome Jason Hand. I, Jason, man, I, I always enjoy hanging out with Jason. He does so much for the community. He's one of the founding organizers of DevOps Days Rockies and speaks and helps out people in the community a, a great deal. So if you haven't talked to Jason and see him around, he's always a great guy to talk to. Jason is going to be talking about postmortems and ways we can improve the way we look at our experiences and our careers and how we can improve from those lessons. And I, I think that's one of the most important things for an organization that adopts a learning culture. That's one of the things that the best organizations do when it comes to embracing DevOps culture and practices. Jason's a community evangelist, I'm making that up, uh, but he works a lot in his role professionally with the community at VictorOps. Please welcome Jason. Thanks, Warner. <clears throat> community evangelist, I've never heard that, but I like it. I'll go with that. Um, yeah, so uh, as Warner mentioned, we're going to be talking about postmortems, and, and actually I've got a little bit, uh, some thoughts and feels about just that term too, so uh, let's dive right in. <clears throat> uh, that's me, I'm Jason, I work at a company called VictorOps, they do instant management and on-call management. Um, a lot of you, I know I've already talked to many of you, are customers of ours, I'm not going to say too much about it, but if you have questions, definitely come grab me. Uh, that's me on Twitter, at Jason Hand. I've got a few other things as Warner touched on. Um, I'm one of the uh, core organizers for DevOps Days Rockies. We just had our third one back in April, so we're planning our fourth one uh, for 2018. Um, I have a, a newsletter that I send out as often as I can uh, called Handpick DevOps. And if you're interested in that, you just go to the website there and sign up. And then I'm also a, a host of a, um, a podcast called Community Pulse, which is all about uh, building and nurturing and maintaining healthy community within tech, within IT. Um, that could be within your organization or just in general. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Now, one of the things... Um, I was able to do this past year is I uh, had great privilege to write a book for O'Reilly, which is an awesome experience. If you ever have an opportunity to do it, uh, I would say go for it because it's, it's opened the doors to a lot of things. Um, and this particular book, it was originally titled Postmortems, but then uh, I started circulating the draft among sort of other leading experts in our industry surrounding uh, post-incident analysis, retrospectives, whatever the term is, root cause analysis, all that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> I, uh, after getting feedback um, from all these other experts, we kind of all determined that, you know what, that term postmortem, it's pretty terrible. It's really not a good word to use to, to describe what it is that we're doing here. So what if we, what if we try to just get rid of that term totally? So uh, I, the title of the book was called Postmortems. I went through and stripped that out, stripped any mention of postmortems out of the entire text with the exception of one um, with one little small blurb, which essentially said, the reason why I'm doing this, the reason why we sort of collectively want to move away from this term is that the, the word postmortem insinuates the search for the cause of death. And while, you know, maybe we want to understand some causal factors, we kind of want to get to the heart of what actually problem, or what actually was part of the problem, the point of these exercises is not necessarily to discover the cause, and it's definitely not something that uh, is only going to be done after some tragic or terrible thing uh, that we might sort of associate as death. So anyway, needless to say, this talk is called, or uh, I've titled it Scrutinizing the Scrutiny, but essentially it's, let's take a different angle uh, on these, you know, postmortems and see if we can come up with a better way, something that sort of helps us in this new modern DevOps world, uh, moving away from root cause analysis and that kind of thing. Now, in the book, um, I had uh, J. Paul Reed, who's a, an another expert in this area, I had him write the foreword for me, and this is a little quote um, from that. Now, what I've got highlighted here, I think, are the two most important aspects of this particular quote. The first one there is that the complex socio-technical systems. I think in a lot of cases, we forget that the system that we're building, or the systems that we're building, include the people. There are people who are actively building, supporting, maintaining, responding um, to the system itself, and they are part and parcel to the overall greater system. And I think we sometimes forget that. That's a big reason why we go after empathy. It's a big reason why we try to squash blame. It's a big reason why we try to just understand the human elements of uh, incident response, but also retrospectives and how we can go in and improve those. Now, one of the other things that you have highlighted here is the idea of reactions. Now, I think what Paul actually meant here is our responses to those problems, not necessarily our reactions, because again, I'm a stickler for terms, but reactive 
kind of insinuates reactionary, chaotic. And that's another idea that has been sort of part and parcel to incident response and going in and understanding from failure is that when something goes wrong, we instantly sort of react to it. In sort of this new DevOps paradigm that we're starting to learn about and understand, we, we realize that being reactionary, that kind of thing, isn't something we can totally move away from. You have to be responsive, and, and that's the idea of being reactive is there. But really something we have to all start thinking about is being more proactive rather than reactive. So that's one of the things that I talk about uh, a lot in the book is how do we sort of understand or, or reset our understanding of systems and how they fail and what we can do to sort of safeguard ourselves against that because honestly we can't avoid it. We can't prevent failure. It's always going to be part of complex systems. So it's really better to just sort of prepare and be proactive and you know, carry sort of more of a readiness stance. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So when I talk, when I when I say readiness, what you know that can mean a lot of things. But what we're really trying to say here is let's be prepared. Let's just understand, like I said, that failure is going to happen. We need to be able to know about that failure and re respond to that failure and recover from that failure as quickly as possible. The teams that have figured this out, they're driving their time to recover down and down. And so we hear a lot of things about how you know, you know a good metric to see if you're doing this DevOps thing um, you know in a better way, continuous improvement, is what does your MT TR tell you? Is that going down and down over time? So anyway, we're, we want to have this idea of readiness. You know, be more like a pit stop crew where you just know that that car is going to come in. It's going to need new tires. It's going to need a top off on fuel. It's going to need you to pull out the fender. And then it needs to get back out on the racetrack. That's sort of the new world. We have to look for ways to optimize for speed. In a lot of cases, when we go into incident response, in particular when we go into learning from those incidents, we don't necessarily optimize for speed. We don't necessarily sort of prepare ourselves to actually get better at dealing with the um, just sort of inevitability of failure. Now, another sort of problem to this is sort of how we... <laughs> I don't know, sort of just address our work in general. How many have heard within your offices that this is how we do things around here? This is just the way we get things done. It, it's a very common and probably one of the most problematic um, sort of mental ideas that most of us have, along with, I would say, uh, Newtonian thinking of cause and effect. There's, there's some you know, sort of fallacies there in terms of complex systems. But uh, I have in this book, and, and definitely in all of my talks and the people I interact with, I take a very hard stance that root cause analysis actually does not do us any favors whatsoever in preparing for the future. How many of you are, are you have to do a root cause analysis? It's, some, it's part of a process, whether it's ITSM, ITIL, or something. It doesn't matter what you're calling it, but there is a process. You have to do these root cause analysis. In my experience, a lot of times those end up feeling just sort of like a checkbox. They're just something we have to go do. Um, it's just part of the procedure. But at the end of the day, if we stop and think about it, what we learned from that experience, what we learned from that exercise is quite minimal. We've come up with what we believe to be the root cause. Hopefully, we didn't, believe, we didn't conclude that it was human error. Um, but that often happens, as we, see, as we saw uh, recently with Equifax. Um, but this idea that there is a root cause is something that we, we simply have to stop sort of believing in. The systems that we're building are far too complex. There's just a lot of moving pieces. They're constantly evolving, constantly changing, especially as we move further and further into continuous deployment, continuous delivery. There isn't a root cause. And that's something that I think a lot of people believe because they'll do these root cause analysis and they'll come up with multiple root causes, which sounds silly, but that's just something that, you know, sometimes we just kind of let it slide. Um, and so when we start to look at these um, failures and what's going on, when we slip back into or sort of maintain our old way of doing things, um, as we've noticed through a lot of the conversations in DevOps, we can't sort of just sit on our own ways, our own our old processes. We have to continuously look for ways to improve that. And, and that includes how we go into incident retrospectives as well. And so... Um, there's a really great book out there called The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error by this guy named uh, Sidney Decker, who's, I would say, probably the leading expert in all of this type of stuff. And I think he makes an excellent point here that I've tried to include in a lot of my talks, is that cause is not something you find. Cause is actually something you construct in the discussion. You sort of declare or manifest what the cause is. And if you've got several of us, let's just t say if we took this entire audience and we divided up into small groups and you set us all out to do a five wise root cause analysis, 
Jesus, I guarantee there would be a lot of different root causes that all of us would come up with because all of us have our own bias and our own sort of perception of what took place and and what we did and what was going on. And so we're going to go down different paths, different paths of discussion, different cognitive paths. And so we end up actually creating the cause in our mind and then sort of making it official as though this is what caused the problem when that simply isn't the facts. Uh, If anything, you've just kind of stopped asking questions. And so we have to re-evaluate cause and effect and, and how we can address cause and effect and sort of learn from that. And there's three sort of common models. The first one is the most common one, I think, still today, especially for those who are really rooted in root cause analysis. Um, And that is the sequence of events, this idea that everything kind of works linearly, everything kind of behaves like dominoes, one thing falls and then another thing falls, and yeah, maybe they start to cascade, but there was still that one thing, and it all worked in a sequence of events. That's one model that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of companies still sort of embrace. Then there's another model called the epidemiological, a little bit of a mouthful, uh, where we believe that problems in the systems are latent and that hardware and software as well as managerial and procedural issues hide throughout our systems. And again, systems includes people, okay? It has to include people. We have to start reminding ourselves that these are not simple mechanical systems. This is software on hardware built and operated by people. There are human beings involved in the system. And then the, the sort of the third model that the DevOps community has widely embraced is what we call the systemic model. And this says that the system itself is a systemic byproduct of people and organizations trying to pursue success with imperfect knowledge under the pressure of other resource constraints, such as scarcity, competition, and time limits. So this is definitely the, the model that, you know, what we call the unicorns out there have started to sort of accept and embrace and, and build their, their framework around is that failure is just normal. We've, we have to normalize this idea, especially as we get to where we're rapidly deploying new software. It's usually during that deployment, um, you know, in terms of probabil- probability, that that's when something goes wrong. But there's also just a lot of things that happen once it gets into production. You have users that go in and do, you know, who knows what. And there's there's this idea that we just have to believe that there's always going to be failure. And we have to sort of normalize that and prepare for that type of new world. And so that leads us into um, post-incident review. And I I say, you know, at the bottom there, i.e. post-mortem, because that's a term. I'm not going to try to, like, get on anyone's case and say you shouldn't use it. But actually, you probably shouldn't use it. but it doesn't matter what you call it. You know, I really don't. I really have no qualms about what the what the term is that you use. It's more about what your approach is and, and what you're doing when you go into these. Um, so I thought what we'd do with the remainder of our time here is actually go through a fictional story. This is based on a, a case study that's inside the book, um, where we can sort of see um, an example and and of some sort of brief outage, some sort of service disruption that somebody had to go through, a team had to kind of deal with. And I want you to start kind of realizing that there is a story here, and that those stories uh, require sort of input from different places and different people and the, and, and the folks that were involved with, you know, whether this is building software or responding to software or whatever the case is, there's a story that has to be told. And it's in this story that we actually start to learn things. We, we start to include the human element. We start to include why people were doing what they did. What made them think that that was the right thing to do in that moment. And those are the types of things that do not show up in your traditional root cause analysis. Those focus more on technical problems. But we have to start including the human pieces. That's actually where the real learning starts to evolve. That's how we start to understand more about the system. We'll never, there's no way, any one person in your, in your organization knows the system in its entirety. We never will. But we want to keep inching closer and closer to some sense of certainty about how things behave. We have to de- develop these mental models in our mind about how the system works and in different ways under certain circumstances. And so you have to constantly learn. That's why there's this big push about continuous improvement, continuous learning, because that's really our only hope here, is to continually try to understand more of the system as it's constantly changing. So um, we're going to look at an outage here, 38-minute outage from a company called Acme Dash. By the way, if you go to acmedash.com, that's where you can find all the slides for this. So what we want to do is create a timeline and event. Now, I have... I have this slide here because I want to point out something. There's a term that gets used a lot, especially in accident investigations, especially in some sort of retro, about what happened. Who do we hold accountable? We have to have somebody who's accountable for this stuff. 
Usually, when someone says that, in that tone, in that, you know, inflection, in that context, they mean responsible. They want to hold someone responsible for the problem. They want one neck to ring. They want someone to fire. They want heads to roll. Accountability, in its true sense, in the sense that we talk about in DevOps, is that we want people to give an accurate account of what happened. That's it. We want them to feel safe saying, this is what I saw, this is what I felt, this is what I thought I should do, this is what other people were telling me. We want all of that information because that exposes areas of the systems that we didn't realize were there. That, that takes us to the latent parts of the problem that we just didn't know existed. And maybe that's the idea that there's a procedure that someone does under certain circumstances that I, as a CTO, had no idea that's what they were doing. I didn't know that was part of their troubleshooting task. I didn't know that that's what they thought that they should do under that circumstance. They kept that to themselves. They didn't discuss that because we were doing stupid root cause analysis, which only focused on the technical bits. So we want accountability, but I want it in its truest sense. We, no one is ever responsible for a problem. Even the Equifax guy, he was not responsible for that problem. So let's look at the story. We're going to start at 4.03 p.m., and we've got our buddy Gary here. Can you guys read that? Yeah. So Gary is a member of our support team, and he just casually happens to check Twitter and notices a, a, a mention about Acme Dash. Now, Gary's in support, so he's got a few tickets that he needs to work and close first. So he does that, and he steps through two tickets and decides, you know what? I've got some free time. I'm going to hop back on Twitter. I'm kind of curious what that mention was and see if anybody's responding to it. So he goes and he looks, and sure enough, there are a few more uh, mentions about Acme Dash. And he can tell, I don't know if you can read that there, but he can see that uh, there are people saying, I'm having trouble logging in. logging in. Is Acme Dash down? I can't log in. What's going on? So people were starting to see and notice and socially complain about a problem with Acme Dash. So at 4.16, uh, Gary turns around. He can't see anybody in the engineering team, but he sees Kathy online. He sees her on Slack, and he reaches out to her. She's one of our top engineers. She's fairly new, but she's a great, uh, great teammate, always willing to help. And so he, he asks Kathy, hey, can you take a look at what's going on here? I'm seeing people sort of you know, say a few things on Twitter, um, and maybe we need to look into this. So Kathy does, and she verifies, first of all, by going to Acme Dash, that she can't get to the login page either. So, with this new knowledge, uh, they go ahead and file a ticket within their uh, internal ticketing system to sort of keep tabs on this and update management on what's going on. And then, within a minute later, uh, Kathy is digging in, trying to find documentation, trying to find run books, trying to find anything that tells her where to start. Where do I go? If I can't log into the system, what's the first step? And she spends a considerable amount of time just trying to dig up this documentation. Like I said, she's new. She's an awesome, uh, awesome engineer, but it doesn't matter how good you are, there's still information you can't have in your, own, in your own head. We've got to have that stuff documented. So she's looking for that information. Um, finally, a few minutes later, she locates something that tells her how she can get into the system. And so she fumbled around for a little bit, but finally she was able to log into the affected server by 426. Notice this is 23 minutes after Gary initially noticed something on Twitter. Now, at 428, just like any good sysadmin, any good engineer who's trying to dig into a problem, you go, uh, once you log in, let's run um, top. Let's just see what processes are running. See if we can find or spot you know, a rogue application, a rogue process that we don't think should be doing what it's doing. And sure enough, um, she sees something up there that's, uh, that's running at 92.3%. Now, again, she's not super familiar with the overall architecture of the system, all of the processes, all of the things that are running, but she does have a hunch that this, this doesn't feel right. This, this seems like a clue here. Um, but she hesitates on killing it. She doesn't go in and just kill that process thinking that that's going to solve everything up, uh, solve everything for her. What she does then is she attempts to reach out to another person on her team, Greg, who is um, a much more senior uh, engineer on the team. He's one of the original architects. He definitely knows a lot more about the system. So at 429, she reaches out to Greg, uh, again, via Slack, and asks if he can help kind of dig into this. Now, she didn't realize it but at the, time, at the time, but Greg took the day off. It's his daughter's birthday. Uh, he and his wife were at home trying to plan for their party that night. And so, uh, you know, there's a little bit of miscommunication there that he's actually taking the day off and not really able to help. 
But Kathy's still looking for him. She looks through, his, through her phone, uh, through her contacts on her phone. She's still, like I said, pretty new to the company, so she doesn't have contact information for him. She, she then starts looking through inboxes to see if she can find something, and she finds you know, his phone number uh, in, an e- in like a footer of his email somewhere from you know, a couple weeks ago or something. So she finally gets his phone number, and then at 4.32, she gets him on the phone and says, hey, uh, we got a problem. Uh, can, you, can you help us out? You know? And so... This is at 4.32. This whole started off at 4.03. Now we're at 4.37. Another five minutes have passed here. And the reason being, like I said, uh, he has taken the day off. So he needed to kind of stop what he was doing, go find his computers, get his laptop out. And then within five minutes or so, he was back online, letting the, uh, letting the rest of the team know that he's going to uh, take a look and see what he can find out. And he asked Kathy, can you update the status page for us? We need to let other stakeholders know we are aware of the problem. We're taking a look at it. We're going to you know, update you along the way. Now, Kathy is not really sure how to update the status page. She's never done this before. That's not something that they used uh, at their previous company. So she reached out to her, her friend and support, Gary, who says, yeah, I'm happy to help. Give me a second. And, and so together, they get the status page updated to let everybody know. Um, so by 440, they've got that updated. And they're also starting to notice that on Twitter, there are even more mentions of problems. And they've also received 10 support requests. So at this point, not only are customers noticing and complaining online, they have started submitting tickets and sending in emails to support. So people are starting to catch on that something's not quite right. So at this point, it's, it's great that they've got the status page up. They can direct uh, either customers or management or anybody that really wants to know, they can direct them to that page and say, you know, our login's down, but it seems like the API is working at the moment. And then at 441, Greg, who was at home with his family preparing for a birthday party, he jumps in and says that he's solved the problem um, and that the system should be restoring now or services should be coming up and that she should be able to log in. Can you, can you verify this? Can you go to acmedash.com and see if you can get in? So 442, Kathy is able to log in. She can confirm that, indeed, the login page is up and running. Everything seems to be good. <clears throat> they go ahead and they update the, uh, the status page, and Gary closes the ticket. So now we're at 442. Now, what we have to understand here is that there is a life cycle to every incident, including what happens after the fact. So what we just sort of went through is sort of seeing how did we detect this? First of all, we didn't detect this. Our customers noticed this first. But there's this, there's this phase within, an, within a problem uh, that we call the detection phase. And then there's the response phase. And this is when Kathy was like, okay, I'm aware of this problem. I'm going to see if I can figure it out. I'm going to dive into some documentation. I'm going to log into some servers. I'm going to kick some resources. I'm going to do something. I'm going to understand what's happening. And then I'm going to start doing something to right this ship. I'm going to fix this problem. That's in our remediation phase. And those are the kind of the three main phases. And then we have to move on into the next phase, which, you know, unless you're doing a root cause analysis, unless you're doing some sort of post-instant review, most people never make it into this phase. They just sort of go back to the job that they were doing, pick up where they left off. You don't always make time to do this analysis, but it's actually in this analysis, when we start digging through the rubble, there's all kinds of data points that we can use to start informing improvements into the system. We just have to take the time to sit down and discuss it, and sit down and, and discuss it in a way that actually looks at the system in a more holistic way, in a more systems thinking way that, again, like I said earlier, includes the people part. But this is the analysis phase. And then that analysis phase, like I said, is what informs us into how we can improve the system in lots of different areas. Uh, and that gets us into this like readiness phase. So those are kind of the five phases of incident management. Now, if we step back and we kind of go back into the analysis phase and we look at sort of the overall shape of the three different um, distinct phases within the actual um, incident as it's, being, as it's being worked, we've got the detection phase, the response phase, and the remediation phase. And we can go into each of these in a lot more detail. And I want to take a second here, and because I think sometimes when, I get, when I'm talking on this particular uh, presentation, I get going real fast. i got a lot of stuff I'm trying to get in. We're going to go over now sort of all of the stuff that happened. But when you sit down, if you, if you take this advice, if you, if you take the things that you're learning uh, throughout you know, yesterday and today, and you want to go back and, and try to do these post-instant reviews in sort of a different way, um, there's lots of different approaches to it. And I'm not going to you know, tell you exactly how you should do these. Uh, more I'm hoping to just get through 
why you should be doing these. Because there's, there's lots of different approaches on how you can be performing these things. But at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is learn. So you got to get people together and say, we are just here to learn more about the system and take that learning uh, and make it actionable and put it into our, uh, uh, into our systems as not just something that goes to the bottom of the backlog, but something that we're going to implement. And we're going to implement it very soon. Because until we do, we're, gonna, we're at risk of having these same problems. Um, so there's going to be some sort of uh, you know, time where you're actually discussing that. And I have to kind of breeze over that a little bit in this presentation. But let's pretend we had that discussion. And what we would do during that discussion is, first of all, we'd notice that during our detection phase, that whole thing took 15 minutes. My first instinct is, 15 minutes, okay, I don't necessarily know what the overall impact was or the cost was, but I have a feeling that we could probably at least trim a minute off of that. Is there something we can do to shave time just in the detection phase? Well, there definitely is, and if we start just kind of discussing some of the obvious things, some of the obvious uh, observations, um, seems like you can read that. One of the first things is that we didn't detect this on our own. That seems like a huge problem to me. Um, so we need to put some monitoring in place. We've got to put something there that tells us before our customers that something's not right. That seems like low-hanging fruit. Um, the next thing that's obvious for the detection phase is we didn't really have a clear path on how we're supposed to respond to these. It just so happens that somebody from support noticed it, and then he just happened to like, be a little bit more friendlier with Kathy than somebody else and noticed that she was on Slack, so he just reached out to her. That's not necessarily a very clear path on who's supposed to be doing what when this type of thing uh, comes up. So for me, that's two obvious ones. We don't have to dig in very far to find two very impactful things that could help for our incident response uh, efforts in moving forward. Then if we take a look at sort of the response phase, the next phase, that took nine minutes. And if you look at some of the things that happen, the obvious observations within here is, first of all, it's not common knowledge on how you're supposed to connect to all the systems whenever there's a problem. So was, she, uh, Kathy had a little bit of fumbles, a little bit of like kind of time ticking away that shouldn't have, just trying to figure out what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? Who do I, who do I reach out to if I'm in trouble? All that kind of stuff. There's definitely a, a million ways that you can improve that experience. So the access to the systems for that first responder was a little bit clumsy and confusing. Maybe somebody like Gary or Greg who's been with the company a lot longer, they already have that stuff in their mind, but not everybody will. And we aren't sure who's responsible for updating the stakeholders or, or updating that status page. So that's something else, too, that there was a little bit of sort of disconnect on who's supposed to do that um, and, and how do you do that. So those are ob uh, kind of obvious observations as well. And then we get into the remediation phase. Now, before I zoom into this, I want to point out uh, a couple of the red things up here. So when I visualize an incident, when I look through the whole timeline and create that shape, I always look for areas where somebody did something. And we'll just call it a task. But somebody did something that actually provided either neutral or negative value to the overall efforts of driving that incident down. So you can kind of think of it as like a burn down chart. And there were two things that happened in there that provided actually kind of stepping us back. One is she didn't have contact information, um, and, and then she spent too much time kind of like looking through her phone and then looking through her email while the clock was still ticking and the company's losing money. So just wanted to point those out. It's always good to sort of visualize this stuff because you can see those are things that somebody did that actually did not help. And you want to see if you can look for areas to sort of remove those types of things. So if we look into the obvious findings here, first of all, we did have a yet-to-be-identified process that we need to sort of dig into a little bit later. We don't need to understand it while we're trying to remediate, but we want to find out what does that process, because at the end of the day, that's what Gary uh, ended up doing. He just killed that process, and then things started to recover. Some of you might say, well, there's your root cause, but again, what was that process tied to? What other things does it interact with? Maybe it's touching something else over here, if it were me, I wouldn't kill that because it might kill something over here and that touches five other things. So there's more investigating that we need to do to understand what that one process was. And maybe that's where some more technical discussion gets involved. Um, but at the end of the day, that's when something we had to like dig in just a little bit further. And then pulling in other team members was difficult. We had um, some, of it, some of the conversations were happening in Slack. Some of them were happening over the phone. Uh, in many cases, things go over on just a, a basic instant message or on email. But if we don't have really like kind of very clear channels on how we're supposed to deal with that, that can definitely delay the, the remediation as well. And there's a couple other uh, obvious things that we can uh, look at too that I'm going to skip ahead just for the sake of time. 
Now, if we look at all of this, this took 23 minutes. The reason why that's important is that the mean time to recover is the easiest way to sort of understand your cost of downtime. There's a really great formula that's found in the State of DevOps report from 2016, how you can actually calculate your cost of downtime. And it requires you understanding or having some notion of what your average time to recover is. So if we kind of start to wrap this up here a little bit, some of the things that you know, just in this 38-minute outage, which are very obvious, that would make our system much more resilient, much more stable moving forward is simple stuff. First of all, we need some better monitoring. We can't, we can't be okay with our customers knowing that we're having a problem before, before we know that we're having a problem. The next one is that we need to create some kind of way to, like, get people involved whenever something's going wrong. We don't even know, like, who, who was on call? Was there anybody who was even on call? Maybe they, didn't, they don't do that kind of stuff. Uh, run books. Everybody has run books. Not everybody updates run books. We've got to make sure that those things actually contain useful information because in those high-pressure situations, they're, they're kind of something that can make a big difference. Uh, we need to make sure that the people who are responding to the systems, that they can actually do something. There's nothing more frustrating than getting paged and then actually knowing where you're supposed to go, but you, you don't have access into those systems. There's nothing you can do. Your hands are tied. And then uh, someone from customer support, they decided in this situation, they should be the ones who actually update the status page. They have the, sort of the closest front-facing uh, relationship with a lot of the stakeholders. So let's put them in, in charge of updating the status page. And then also, we don't really have very good escalation paths. So we went out and grabbed somebody who took the day off to spend it with his family. That shouldn't have been the case. We need to be able to, to be a lot more humane about our on-call practices and let people enjoy their, their time off. Let them rest. Don't let them uh, get burnt out. Now, all of this is really just the idea of continuous improvement, which at the end of the day is what most of us are searching for anyway. In fact, in many cases, when I see people's eyes glaze over as I start to explain DevOps to them, I just say, you know what, forget it. It's just continuous improvement, and that's usually enough to kind of get them pointed in the right direction. We're just kind of trying to continuously improve the people, the processes, and the technology uh, throughout everything that we do. Oh, by the way, that's the link to the book if you're interested in downloading, downloading that. It's free. I'd love to hear your feedback on that. Um, but this continuous improvement you know, is going to lead us to all these action items. And here's sort of the catch. Uh, and I've got just a few seconds here before we're done. These action items typically just get mem memorialized into some sort of artifact, in some sort of document. Here's the things that we thought we were going to do, everyone. And then you don't do them. They just go to the bottom of a backlog. They sit there with all your technical debt. Nobody prioritizes them. And then we start to see these same problems over and over again. So these things have to be prioritized with feature work. And that's something you have to sit down with the product owners and have a heart to heart and tell them that one of your biggest features is your availability. Nobody cares about the next awesome feature or the next awesome whatever you're going to put out on your system if it's constantly falling over, if it's not available, if it's not reliable. So you got to move those action items into, uh, into something that actually gets done. And then, of course, we want to summarize this into some kind of report because people want to know. They want to know not necessarily what the cause was, but that you are looking for ways to improve. Your customer is going to want to know that. Maybe you put some sort of you know, public-facing uh, you know, review out there or analysis out there, but also something you circulate internally with the whole company and with definitely management to say, here's what we know, here's what we're doing to improve. And all of this is really, again, sort of that idea of just being more ready, being more prepared, being less reactionary and more proactive. And to me, that's, that's really the whole goal of all of this, is that we can't sort of sit on our ways and say, the way we've done it is fine. We don't need to look for improvements. That's actually not true. This whole DevOps movement, it's actually trying to hammer in all of our heads that we have to break out of that paradigm. We have to start realizing that no matter what you think is the right way today, it's going to be different tomorrow. There's some other way to do it. Maybe not technically or, you know, actually tomorrow, but in the very near future, there's another new way to do it. And we have to constantly be looking for that new way that's better and, and more appropriate for us in our organization. Uh, that's all I've got time for. I appreciate uh, you guys having me out here today and, and being a part of this, uh, this conference. And I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but I'll be around and we can do open spaces and I'll, I'll chat with you at lunch and that kind of thing. So thank you very much. Thanks so